Hey guys, Anthony with Lucky Dog Guitars. We got Mr. Whitey Morgan here to pick up his Lucky Dog today. Good to have you down, man. Had a good time working with you. Uh, so I had a few questions for you that I haven't heard other people ask you. Um, so music again. I see a lot of people doing country outlaw stuff coming out of Michigan. So I was curious, you know, is your family roots there? Are you born there? Well, just tell me. About yeah, that. yeah. I mean, that's a pretty easy answer. I guess a lot of people don't realize well, we should realize it because there's so many songs about people from the South driving to the North to have jobs. Yeah. Well, uh, I mean, thousands and thousands of them did that. So what ended up happening is you get guys like me that were born there, but parents and grandparents that came from the South. So, you know, it's like a transplant. Like I grew up going to church, a good Southern kid and eating things that only families in the South ate. And my friends who were from the north, you know, you just like, what the hell is this? But uh, but yeah, my grandfather worked in the auto industry, just like a lot of southerners that came up there and played bluegrass gospel in church, and I did the same. So where did they and migrate uh, from? Uh, your grandparents? Uh, my uh, Kentucky and Tennessee. Okay. Yeah. Well, my family were all coal miners, and they moved to Michigan out of. Uh, Southwest Virginia to yeah, get away from right. the coal mines and went yeah. into the automotive industry and mm -hmm. work up there at Florida. Another, the same thing. Everybody was yeah, there. That's another yeah. kind of misery. I mean, well, uh, coal mine with misery, you move up there and, and then you, you know, work on cars and develop a, an alcohol addiction like most of those guys did. Like, and uh, there's a reason why there's liquor stores that surround every one of those factories. It's a, it's a, it's a hard life. So yeah. Flint, I mean, is that? pretty much right in the city. Yeah, yeah, Flint is about an hour north of Detroit, and I always tell people Flint is where General Motors was created. Detroit was Ford, and there was always that kind of tension to me. But, uh, but yeah, so my grandfather came up playing in the hockey tonks, being a, you know, just going out there, rip roaring drunk, and then by the time I was born, he found his, found God again and was in the church, so I didn't get, I didn't get to see that. The wild side uh, well, i heard the stories and he's the one that taught me to play guitar and you know my dad wasn't around much when i was young so it was like they just call me off on grandpa and we'd go you know go why he would take me to church functions and i'd sit there with an acoustic and yeah. i'd sing harmonies while he'd <laughs> give me martin songs and that's funny that was my next question i was yeah. curious how in the world you ended up growing up in flint somehow getting into the outlaw country and stuff. Yeah, I mean, it was, it was all him, I guess. But I mean, it didn't take right away. Like any kid, you're not interested in what your parents or grandparents are doing when you're young. But then he passed when I was 19 after playing punk rock bands and metal bands in my teen years, just trying to be as loud as possible. So it's kind of, that's, that's the perfect, you know, equation. You get the kid playing punk rock that has the, bluegrass country roots and then my grandpa passed and that those worlds kind of came together when i started to play started to do the country thing i was, was like it's just not loud enough man we gotta be it's gotta be louder that's what i'm used to it's a big loud stage and, and uh yeah it's kind of well, like, I know the way the sound was born i guess you and i talked about that quite a bit that we're kind of into some of the same yeah. old metal stuff and oh yeah that's what i started on you know, and then I started getting interested in Merle Haggard and Jones and all that stuff. And I had already learned all this rock stuff and meshed it together. And it really, I think, yeah, it made me different than the other you yeah. know guys. And I, th I think the same thing about you guys. It's, it's more raunchy, yeah, just gutsy, yeah, just back beat, loud guitars, and you know, try to keep it as tight as you can, keep the rails on, or keep it on the rails while you're, you know, I think I always and... hold direct modeling and stuff that everybody's doing it's, yeah, this might be a no hot take let's see no answers on stage and stuff it just doesn't it yeah, does not I'm, sound the same i mean i've had this conversation with guys before um my life was kind of i mean I'm talking about the metal metal years but i was you know i was a teenager i didn't have money for a real amp and real guitars i was playing like some cheap knockoff jackson probably through a like crate combo you know and then you go to like some shows like some punk rock shows when you're 16 and you see these guys coming through from dc and seattle and you know they got road cases and they're playing you know big fenders and marshall stacks and strats and tellies that look like they're beat to hell this road worn these guys come in they they've slept in a week and to me that was i was 
I loved it. It was like fantasy world. Like I, I want to go on the road. I want road cases. I want to, uh, these guys are like my heroes. I mean, not for most people, I guess they would be, but yeah. So for me, real amplifiers are what, you know, like that was, that's what made all the great music I ever, I ever loved or ever inspired me to do anything. So I get these guys that say, well, I can do any amp I want. It's like, well, don't you just want to sound like the same guy all night? Don't you want one sound? Yeah. I mean, if you're playing a cover band where you got you're playing Van Halen one song and Waylon Jennings the next, I guess maybe you need twenty different presets. But I just need one. Well, I try boost pedal and an amp. I mean, I stuff. Yeah, it's, you know? it's, yeah, it's pretty it cool. cool. I, I actually have a little amp at the house that I use. Like it's and that's why because when I'm home, I might want to play ten different styles in one day. But on stage, I'm, I'm the same guy all night. I, you know? Even with those, I end up like. I've got three presets on there or something. I'm like, yeah, I could just have a, you know, my amp up hit one or two pedals and I'm, I'm pretty much good. But, but you kind of hit on your early guitar stuff. Like, do you remember what your very first guitar was? Yeah, I actually uh, just made a video. I ordered a, a, a new uh, Gibson reissue of Black Beauty, like the 68 that they're doing right now. And I honestly didn't re realize it until I had already ordered it. But that was my first guitar was a Hondo ripoff of that exact same guitar. And my grandpa brought it over. He, I remember this pretty well. I don't remember much from, you know, when I was 10, 11 years old. But uh, he had stopped at a garage sale on the way over at my neighborhood and just bought it for like 15 bucks or whatever. It had no strings on it or anything. And he, he uh, went to his house and over the next day and showed me how to string. I'd always just play his guitars, just chords and stuff. That was my first like guitar that was mine that was in my bedroom you know you don't have it anymore no i sold it to uh, a friend who knows whatever happened to it but i do from what i remember it was you know like a lot of those japanese ripoffs that were pretty pretty damn good guitars man uh i would love to still have it I, pretty cool. i've got like a 70s uh greco less Paul. yeah yeah like, yeah no, i mean it's, those are, those are killer it's good right yeah. yeah some guys prefer them i mean man my dad showed up uh one year i was about 13 or 14 years old and he uh Brought a '69 Fender Bronco in. He had bought it at a pawn shop. I still got it. I did. I did keep that. I'm always a wheeler dealer, but I did keep that one. Yeah. Glad that's that's what I got started on. But um, um, what was your first gig? Uh, first real gig? I don't even. I mean, honestly, I don't know. I so so much. Yeah, it was probably. You know what? It was. It was. Uh, our rehearsal space was in my buddy's garage, and. Uh, we did, yeah, we did like, a, you know, a show where like all the girls from the neighborhood came. <laughs> you know, the garage is about the size of this room. It's just like a one car garage. And we, that was our rehearsal space. And we thought, well, why, why not just do a show? And I, yeah, well, I think we did that a few times. That was, you know, was everything. We had everything. We had amps and guitars and girls. And it was like, yeah, this is, a, this is pretty good living right gotcha. here. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> you know? Um, so I, I know you probably go down YouTube rabbit holes and stuff like everybody, but that's how I found you. Probably, I'm going to say mid 2000s. And as far as I can tell, you were still kind of just playing around Michigan. Yeah, I maybe mean, doing some weird. We used to do weekends out, you know, or a couple weekends and back, but it's mostly Midwest stuff. We've been down Ohio, maybe dip into Kentucky, Pennsylvania, you know be two weekends at the most sometimes just one and then back but yeah but yeah i mean we were playing around michigan as much as possible i just love we do the, you know like the typical three sets yeah you play the 10 to 1 or 9 to 1 or whatever and just drink up all your big pain beer <laughs> and have, have a hell of a time yeah and just learn your crap learn what you know what sound you like and what, what you want to do so at what point did it kind of turn the corner to start doing like the cross country tour and things like that? I mean, I would say probably just finding the guys that wanted to do it because you know, a lot of the guys that were were doing it, that I was gigging with back then were, you know, they had full time jobs. I mean, I did too, but I, it was I was ready to go. I was ready to go, right? and I just think. You know, like I said from before, watching those punk rock bands roll from town, it's like, that's what I want to be doing. I don't care if I'm making any money as all well. I'm just not sitting around here anymore. Yeah. But uh, I think it took finding find the right guys that had that same mindset. And, and you know, and I, by this time I was working, I was a 
worked at a hot rod restoration shop painting and body work. And, you know, I had accumulated a nice big snap on box full of tools. And I finally, one day was like, I'm done with this shit. I offered, I gave my buddy a really good deal on the whole box. I kept a few things and, uh, I bought the van and trailer with that. Never looked back. Was that like late 2000s or? No, that was probably 2002, maybe. Okay. Like that. Yeah. So you're already kind of starting to get out of Michigan and stuff by the time I found you. Then. Yeah. So I, mean, I just I tell people well, I've been in the tour for twenty years. I mean that's about what it's been. We're, we're looking at it's two thousand twenty four now. So yeah, in by two thousand four we were definitely doing, you know, multi weekend shows. I mean it wasn't we were still playing a lot in Michigan, but it was yeah, we were we were out of town quite a bit. I mean, we already had the first record I think was already done and written. I just hadn't recorded it yet. Are you completely living, living out in California now? Yeah, but I mean I'm I'm not there all that often. Uh, it's getting less and less. Uh, but yeah, I just, you know, met a, like everybody, me a girl in California, and it's a hell of a lot nicer and what the weather out there than it is in Michigan. It's a cool place you guys found, yeah. the bandit town. So, yeah, was yeah. that just a, was it just a uh, abandoned town? Well, it was the uh, bandit town. My wife found it about 10 years ago. It was, uh, had been up for sale forever. It started out as like, it's up in the mountains, uh, like central, eastern central. California, but uh, gold country, it's like a wilderness up there. The town I live in is a little tiny town. Um, but so they had, they had built a kind of a movie set where it was just like, like you know, how they do like the, the facade is there, but it's not really a building, yeah. And it was just like six buildings or whatever, maybe five buildings. And then they somebody bought it and finished it. And then they built a saloon, like a legit saloon with a restaurant onto it in the 70s. It was open for a while, and then it closed for a couple of decades, and she found it, and it did, you know, kind of falling apart. She got it and put a bunch of money into it, and I've, I've helped her along the way a little bit, but I just, it's her thing. I do shows there and, and uh, you know, try to help out as much as I can, but we're both, she's a lot like me, where it's, you know, we, we just fall in love with so many different things. It's like, I'm obsessed with this for a year, and then I don't care about that anymore. I, I moved on to this. It's whatever is making you happy at the moment. We're, we're both kind of like that. We, we, you know, we just love to just yeah. follow it because it sure takes us, you know. If my wife would go for it, I would have old cars all the way down to the end of the driveway. Yeah, I mean, just, that's uh, what I was, I was, I had thing. too many of those for a while too. And, but, uh, well, I got sick of working on other guys' cars and why I couldn't afford it. I imagine if I got back into it now, it would be a real problem. Well, uh, how'd you find out about Lucky Dog? Uh, I mean, we didn't know enough. Joey, my guitar player, I brought you up a few times. Like I think you showed me some guitars years ago. And uh, I recently kind of took a bit of a break from drinking, got my mind clear, and realized that I still was obsessed with guitars and amps and playing. I hadn't played my guitar at home in a long I mean, year, so I was just was kind of burnt out. Yeah. And I took a break from drinking and kind of, you know, I've come through the fog and all of a sudden, my kid started playing guitar at home, so I started playing his guitar through his little gorilla amp. I'm like, a Metallica riffs on the gorilla amp. This is so cool. And then I ended up getting me a little metal rig, a little uh, ESP uh, Les Paul at the house. And it's just, just something to, like, you know, pass the time while I'm sitting there in front of the TV or something. And, uh, yeah, that's uh, that kind of started it. And then I started thinking that I've never really had a proper second telly i've always had the one i built and that's been one i've used for that's a 2000 that's a 2004 actually so it's 20 years now but i've used that same one and uh and then i remembered you and i remembered the pictures i saw of your guitars that reminded me you know just the i, I must have saw a, a tobacco burst or something you had done with pick and some leather on it I was like oh that's my style right there yeah i mean i look, yeah. I look at your guitar and i'm just and I'm, i kind of think about like right on yeah, that's it doesn't that's, look right for White on the walk out. Yeah, that. like a lot. Yeah, sure, and that's how your old guitar is. So I kind of felt like, you know, be, yeah, for a you give a nod to that, yeah. you know. Yeah, I mean, you're right. It. Uh, I mean, I haven't played another guitar besides that guitar on stage. I had maybe one backup that I that I put together, like a parts Telecaster, that I used a little bit, but it just never felt right, and I just stopped playing it. 
And recently I picked up a couple less balls that I use for maybe one or two songs that make sense for that type of sound. And I love the way they feel. I mean, I grew up playing them, but then I just went to the telly for so long. It's just such a workhorse guitar, you know I mean? That's what it was built to be, you know, a guitar that, that you can bust the neck off of, put a new one on, and, and you're going to be able to play the gig the next night. I'm just so used to it. Yeah. 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 Like I said, I like I like the Les Paul now because it feels right for maybe that specific song. Like it's something where I'm just doing some big chords on. Yeah. And it's got that big warm sound. But if I'm doing any, you know, the Les Paul's not going to, it's not going to pop like it's supposed to. Well, what's next for you guys? Uh, we got a ton of shows coming up this summer and then release of new songs. I'm just going to try to just put out as much as I can, uh, um, keep myself motivated. I think the way for me to do that is kind of how everybody's doing right now, which is just not getting bogged down with the whole album. I'm going to put out a few songs at a time and then they will be put on an album. Yeah. But it, but all that while I'm saying that they're not going to all sound different. I'm going to record in the same studio with the same gear. I'm just going to only take on three at a time because for me, it's harder now with my, you know, my kid and family obligations to go into a studio and really spend that much time to and concentrate and deal with, you know, the last album, I felt like it was dealing with mixes on the road. They're sending me mixes. I'm sitting there before a gig trying to, you know, okay, this steel needs to go down 2 dB here. And, you know, that kind of like nitpicking a mix. Whereas if I'm only doing three, it's my brain can wrap around. We're not pretty announcing. But when I'm doing 10 or 12 at a time, and it, it gets overwhelming, and uh, yeah, the, the studio that we just did at the, the time we were in there, I, I loved it. It was it went a lot faster. I wasn't I didn't feel as much pressure because I knew it was only three songs and I had them ready. It wasn't going in going, hey, I got three songs. We're going to come up with the other seven while we're here. Hopefully that works. That's just that's just putting so much pressure. It's I, appreciate it's coming by. Okay. I appreciate it, and I just want you to know that I've. You know, I've built a handful of guitars, you know, never cut, cut them from scratch, but I've refinished and done lots of setups and lots. Of, I know the amount of work that goes into something like this, man, it, it means a lot to me. And I, I just saw the guy that was here right before you got here. Uh, he was talking about different players we've had. We've had Def Leppard and Garth Brooks and all this stuff. And I, and I was like, you know, um, so many guitar builders, you know, they, they want to say that. No, Brad Paisley, and this is not a knock on Brad Paisley or whatever. I said I've always said from the beginning, I won't lie to playing like a problem. So this is a great day for me, and I hope you just love it. Thanks for coming by, man. I appreciate the hell out of it. Yeah, we appreciate you. Hey, Brad, how you doing? Good, man. Thanks for having Yeah, no.